I gotta tell you, the, uh, the first question I have is, how many of you have listened to Away With Words? Yeah. All right. How many of you have listened more than once? Yeah. Hey, even better. Well, hello, my people. My people. <laughs> hello, uh, English users, language lovers, I hope. Readers, probably, all of you. Readers? Oh, uh, I, I readers, I see those. <laughs> Cell phone readers, that sort of thing. Uh, there were some things that, said, that were said today that have kind of upset my course. If I were a ship, I would be, uh, I'd be headed for the Panama Canal instead of for the ports of Northern Europe. Because, uh, for example, um, Serge said something about jargon that I want to comment about. He made a really interesting point. This was the fellow about cleaning up beaches. He explained that the officials in charge of keeping the beaches clean, well, this is the way I interpreted it, they were hiding behind language. A really simple solution was masked by jargon, and even threw the word up there in really big letters. Jargon, get, jargon gets a little bit of a bad reputation. I don't know that it always deserves it, but usually jargon is a cover for cloudy ideas, for unclear thinking. Another one of the things we saw was the, the animated word slideshow that Larry Rosenstock put up there from one of his students. That was fantastic. It was brilliant. That was about the orthography of math. And that slideshow was fantastic. The orthography of math is surprisingly unlike the orthography of language. And that the idea can be transmitted without necessarily having but the picture there. No sound needed. Another thing we saw was the story arc from David LaCour's, right? The idea that you need to transmit emotion. This, the heart, needs to be transmitted in an arc to the people who are observing to the audience. The reason these things stuck with me, and, and that wasn't the end of what I was struck by so far today, was because this is what we try to do. We are basically language evangelists. We send a message out to the world, a beacon, if you will, that says the language is interesting and that it's important. And yeah, you know, it's easy to say, oh yeah, because speak it, that's naturally, we, we all speak English. Uh, of course, this is simple. Of course, this is easy to understand. But I want to tell you something. How many of you heard that made you pause and said, well, that's not quite right. Oh, he said the word ain't. Oh, he shouldn't have said the word ain't. Maybe he said the word shit. Did anybody say the word shit yet? Am I the first? Nice. <laughs> but it unsettled you for just a second. What if I said the word fuck? <laughs> yeah, you laughed. Why? Because you're nervous about it. You're judging me from my language just as you've judged the language of everyone who's up here. And what's really interesting is that we allow ourselves to judge people for things that they say and things that they write. We allow ourselves to have certain thoughts about language that we do not allow ourselves to have about gender, about race, about sexuality, and a whole host of other issues. We allow ourselves to judge people and to hold them accountable for the things that issue from their keyboards and their mouths or their pens if they're old-fashioned their styli and their clay tablets. We allow ourselves to judge them. And I'm here to argue that I don't think that that's fair. And actually, it's not the right way to do it. There's another approach. I kind of want you to turn this around. And instead of being critical, I want you to be analytical. When you hear something interesting, and I, interesting, I'm going to define interesting in my own way for you. Interesting language is language that catches you up for just a second. You weren't quite sure what they meant. You weren't quite sure what they had to say to you, and you're not quite sure that they were on the right path. They were diverted to the Panama Canal instead of to the ports of Northern Europe. Right? Uh, we call this, my lovely co-host Martha Barnett is here somewhere, lovely and brainy. Martha, where are you? She, up top. <laughs> Waving. Martha and I have a philosophy that sometimes it's better to go out and do field work than it is to go out and make lists of the language offenses of your, of your neighbors and your coworkers and your fellow students and your enemies and your friends alike, because that's what we do. And I know this because we get lots of email. Grant, how dare you? You of all people, you should know better. I would expect you as a leader of language people to be using, you know, and they go on and on and list the, itemize the offenses. And that's just for my mother. 
<laughs> the things that I say wrong on the air, because we are unscripted, it's a natural language for the most part, we have a general idea of what's going to be discussed. Most people ask questions that are within the capacity of Martha and I to answer, and that's fine and fair, but the mistakes come because we are speaking freely, and they're ordinary. And so, when I welcomed you as language lovers today, what I meant by that was that I'm welcoming, I'm welcoming you as neologizers. When you woke up this morning, you started doing a whole bunch of things automatically without thinking about it. You said some things, you said some more things, you re-said some things because somebody didn't hear you. <laughs> Wife, husband, child, coworker. You restated them, which means you said them in different words so that you could be understood again. You, you spent a great deal of time today restating things. And I know this because we can look at whole big masses of data that have been collected in recent decades that show us how people actually speak versus how they think they speak. And the difference between these two things is sometimes very vast. And so in the emails that we get where people talk about things that they encountered, uh, disfluencies in the language of other people, their own disfluencies, oddities, quirks, weirdness. I find that there's a, often a gap there because they are reporting this particular bit of evidence as a single data point. And I'm going to do a footnote here for a second and say I had a wonderful conversation, brief but wonderful, with a man named Lem who's here somewhere a little bit ago. And he talked about it was striking to him that so many of the speakers today talked about data. They talk about organizing your data and using it to influence your ideas. Absolutely. I'm 100% behind that. And it's true in language. Language does not have to be about your gut. It helps. You have uh, native speaker intuition about why I shouldn't say ain't, or why I shouldn't say am it. Am it I not up here on stage? Yes, I am it. Or I'm, I'm, right? Doesn't sound right. You've got intuition about this. You probably can't tell me why it sounds wrong. Right? Are you sure? I, I don't think you can probably tell me. But there, there, there's data out there that can tell you. When I look at the data points that we get in our email inbox and it comes in floods, it comes in voicemail form, we are talking thousands of messages a month. There is an, how shall I put this? A tsunami is kind of a sensitive word, but let's just call this a wave. There is a wave of desire. Not sexual, well, some of it's sexual. But it's a desire for information, mostly toward Martha. You should see the marriage proposals. There is a wave of desire to know more about language. It is an overwhelming desire. I know a lot of people in the language trades. Some of them write newspaper columns for dailies. Some of them have their own radio shows or podcasts. Uh, some of them are linguists and lexicographers, people who make dictionaries. Some of them are English teachers, composition teachers at all levels of school. And they all agree with me when I, when I point out one particular fact about the American people. And uh, frankly, English speakers everywhere, and I assume it's the same in other languages, is that people cannot have their curiosity satisfied enough. There's, there, they, have, they have more requests for knowledge than they have answers, which requires a little bit of field work on the part of the asker. And what I'm suggesting to you is that if you feel yourself interrupted for a moment, and you encounter somebody who said something that you felt was wrong, they used a preposition at the end of the sentence. They started a sentence with hopefully. Right? They had a run-on sentence when they were writing. They don't know how to use commas. Where's their capitalization? U is spelled Y-O-U, not the letter U. Right? You, tell me that you haven't had this occasion, even if you're not a stickler, even if you're not a peever, and I am neither of those things. I occasionally am discomfited by the... Language that I see, uh, there's one particular pronunciation, I'll tell you right now, the word S-T-R-E-N-G-T-H, pronounced strength, bothers me. <laughs> there's a G in there, goddammit. <laughs> we, one of the best calls we ever received was from this lovely young woman who wanted to tell us that there was a word, and I think she was genuinely unable to say the word until we coaxed her into it. The word is moist. <laughs> she, she is repulsed by the word M-O-I-S-T. And it turns out that there are a large number of people repulsed by the word moist. 
just as there were a large number of people who are repulsed by the word ain't, or shit, or fuck, as I've said before. And I should say another footnote. I, I consider myself a, a, a kind of a proctologist of language. It's not that I deal with the dirty end of language, although I do specialize in slang. It's that, that I can look at things analytically without taking it personally that someone's ass is in my face. Um, I get kind of a pass, right? And so when you encounter these disfluencies in footnote, and you go and you encounter these in other people's language, what you need to do is say, I have another data point, let me go find more. Let me go look for more information about this. Let me figure out what the problem is here. Is this one person doing this or is this a lot of people? A lot of our correspondents are on to that. They know that that's the right thing. Either we've trained them well or they came up with it on their own. They say, is it just me or is language going to hell? Does anyone speak English well anymore? And the answer is they all do. They speak their own idiolect. And idiolect is basically means uh, the language of idiots. No. <laughs> no, idiolect means the language that you speak. You have your own particular pattern. Some of it from your father, or your mother, or your auntie, or grandmother, whoever raised you. Some of it from your friends, a lot of it from your friends. Coworkers, stuff you learned in business. Some of the jargon that Serge was talking about. Those people didn't learn that kind of jargon in the cradle. They learned it at school, they learned it at work, they learned it from the business journals at the conferences, conferences like this maybe, right? And all of these, all of the different things that have to do with your idiolect, they are influenced by around you, but you are a shaper of your own idiolect. You do this by stepping into streams, new streams of information, new ways of, uh, and you, you hear things differently, you see things differently, you learn things differently. You investigate what is around you, and you ultimately end up, you know, coming up with an answer. You solve your language problem for yourself, except when you don't, when you go to people like those of us that are away with words. We are a nonprofit. we are independent, we are nationwide, getting larger and larger every day. We added two new stations recently. We're in 73 plus cities around the country. Getting, uh, and the reason that we can grow at this rapid rate as we're, as we're growing is because there is a demand and a hunger, and each of you has this. I know because I've spoken to at least 17 of you today, and another 30 seem to have signed up for the, the Saturday follow-up session, and you're all welcome. Bring your family, your kids, and a picnic lunch. We'll have a great time. Uh, you have this overwhelming desire. Uh, I see that my time is about out here. I ran a little long. Frankly, I think Bill probably should have taken all of my time. He was so wonderful. But um, my closing statement to you is to say that what I wanted you to come away with today, the really simple thing that I wanted to leave you with, is that language is not declining. It is improving, and you are the one doing it. And what I encourage you to do is that when you hear something that doesn't sound quite right, it doesn't need fixing. No, it needs to be recorded and you need to share it with others, gather it up, and come up with some kind of conclusion that you can share with the rest of us so we all can understand language better. Thank you.